one here, Father. Lord, there are probably those here who uh, are just struggling in whatever way, just need to surrender themselves and things to you. Lord, there are no doubt people struggling with health. Lord, we want to just give it over to you, surrender it to you, Lord, knowing you are sovereign. Lord, that perhaps those struggling in their marriage, Father, may they surrender it to you. Those who are struggling to find work or to make ends meet, we surrender it to you. Father, we also know that sometimes we can be the answer to our prayers and our prayers for others and where we can be of assistance, Lord, may we do that. Not just pray, but Lord, where you've called us to assist, to help, to whatever, may we do it. And again, Father, we open your word to uh, this, this final one in our Plan A series. And we surrender it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you want to open your scriptures? That'd be great. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just want to read the first 12 verses here. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by stepping forth, uh, uh, by stepping forth the truth, uh, setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled for those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts and gave us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that his all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not dis in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always uh, being given over to death for Christ's sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us but life is at work in you. We're on our final principle of the Plan A series called Showing Up. If you don't show up, does it happen? As a teenager for a couple of years at least, I used to do swimming training and, uh, and it meant you're supposed to show up. Like, you know, I was reasonably good at swimming and so we had uh, training at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning till 7.30 a.m. six days a week and then 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. I think five days a week. Uh, praise God for daylight saving because when daylight saving came in they decided the water was too cold at 6 a.m. because that would be like five or something, I don't know. 
And so they moved it to 6.30 to 7.30, so we only had an hour in the morning and said what happened to being an hour and a half. Um, it, was, it was hard. It was really hard. We'd swim long and hard, and if we didn't go home exhausted, our coach was disappointed and said we hadn't contributed enough and put in enough. And, you know, there's a point where, you know, you have the right technique, you know, you know where you reach out in the stroke and you pull right through uh, in freestyle right down to as far as your arm will reach and you pull right through and you breathe both sides. I was never great at that. You breathe both sides and you kick a certain way and I was never great at that. But, you know, you have the techniques and when you get the techniques, you, you, you do better and you swim faster. But you've got to show up. That was my major fault. Like my technique was pretty good, not not perfect, but pretty good, and I had natural ability. But but like getting out of bed in the morning and getting down to the pool by six or six thirty in summer in the Tumut, the base of the Snowy Mountains. Couldn't swim in winter because it was frozen. Uh, it's like you know, we only swam in summer, so I'd even restricted it more. And then oh, you were supposed to show up. Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I suspect I got to two, maybe three mornings a week. Evenings probably got to four out of five. But it was like if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. And it was hard. It was hard showing up. Like my, my parents, they didn't want to get out of bed and get me organised and up. You know, they, if you want to do it, if you're motivated, motivated enough, you'll do it. Well, I wasn't motivated enough and I didn't do it. I really didn't show up as I was expected to do. It was hard. And we, and we talk about the Great Commission and we said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Unless you show up. You might have the grow into the likeness of Christ pretty good. You might have the no building relationships, genuine relationships with others, pretty good. You might have the sow when you see them, the sow the seeds of the gospel in conversation. You might have that down pat. You might even have the row together, like Andrew talked about last week. You might have the row together, recognizing that we are part of a body and we can utilize uh, other people in the body of Christ to assist us in this making disciples because God has called us into community. But unless you show up, what's the point? What's the point? And it's not easy to keep showing up for Jesus. Like, you know, you get tired. You might get rejected. You might feel inadequate and you just can't answer questions that people might have. And, and, and so showing up is not so easy. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote this uh, letter to the church at Corinthians, like recognised the struggle of showing up. We see here that he recognised that uh, it, was, it was not easy but he said, in the midst of it all, I do not lose heart, verse 1. In the midst of my ministry, I do not lose heart. And he, and he reflected upon some of the struggles that, that he has. And really it boils down to, if you look at verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it boils down to the fact that he kept his integrity and likewise he kept the message pure. Like he was, he was a man of God who his show Jesus was great and his message he tell Jesus was great. He had this integrity about him and he had the message down pat. He wasn't willing to compromise the message and he wasn't willing to compromise his walk. And so we see, uh, he says, uh, we do not distort the word of God. We do not use deception. We do not use shameful ways. We put it in, um, in clarity, the, uh, the word of God plainly, he says. And even if our gospel is veiled, 
It's veiled not because we're not presenting it clearly. It is veiled because of the God of this age. Uh, Corinth, believe it or not, at least geographically a little, was like Gladstone. Like it was a port city. I think it actually had two ports, but it was a port city. Great place of trade and people came and went. Uh, But maybe another sort of similarity with Gladstone is uh, it was okay to have uh, a faith or no faith. We're in Gladstone and Australia, we talk about people with 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 a faith or no faith are acceptable there was certainly the uh the expectation of uh of of worship of someone or something but it was okay if people had a faith or no faith and so Paul was in the midst of this society where it's like any worship goes we are in the midst of a society where it seems like any or no worship goes and so we've, we find it difficult at times to keep on keeping on. We find it difficult to show up. We gather in our little enclave of church, rightly so, and, and we might there and in our connect groups and otherwise at home, we might grow and we might get to know people and we might sow some seeds and, and we might recognise that we work together as a church in our ministries but also in other ways. Um, but it's like perseverance to keep on keeping on, to keep on showing up. And, and sometimes we too might have this struggle because we recognise the God of this age is against us. The God of this age is against us. But like Paul, uh, we need to not lose heart. But Paul recognises that that we can lose heart. Paul recognises that we are uh, uh, just unworthy. And and he says here, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. But the people at Corinth, they knew what a jar of clay was. Like they had the, the, the great jars of clay. You know, we read about the story of Jesus at the, at the well with the, the great water jars. They would, it would store things. It would store water. There were smaller jars that would um, store oil and they'd put a wick in it and it would create light. And they had jars where, you know, they would... They would put things in for storage, for keeping, for keepsake. And we probably know the, um, about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which had been put in these clay jars and put away for a couple of thousand years, and s- some of the um, fragments and scrolls inside were still readable. We had a mission trip to Nepal a few years ago. I bought a clay jar... Um, I looked around for quite a while, eventually found one that I thought was really nice and that Kathy would really love. There were lots and lots of choice and we were in, like, I would say the middle of nowhere, but it was a town, but it was at some crossroads and we were staying there and I found this, this place which sold some clay jars and I got this clay jar. How do you get it back to Australia? In one piece. Well... Kylie Colville, who was the you know, Colville family, for those in the know here, they were missionaries over there and they were uh, you know, helping us. Uh, Kylie said, you need to nurse it all the way back to Australia. Like on the couple of planes in Singapore, you need to nurse it. In my wisdom, I thought, no. Nah. Wrap it in my undies, wrap it in my shirts, wrap it in my pants, wrap it in the towel, stick it in the suitcase, and hope. Well, we got home and, uh, you know, undid it, and it was there. But it did have a few cracks, which were actually broken bits of the jar. It ended up in our garden and this is all that's left of it in our garden now. 
But the point is those jars of clay were used for like water, were used for, for burning oil, for a light, were used for storing stuff, were also used for hiding treasure. And, uh, but they were fragile, they were common, and they were very breakable, which is fragile, I know. But they were there in everyday use. So when Paul writes to these people who like jars of clay, they had a picture in their mind, they knew exactly. Like, show my age here. Uh, anyone watch Heartbeat? A few weeks, don't, you don't have to admit it. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm not the only one who's mature. Um, a few weeks ago, like, young, I watch it because two things. One is they play great music of the 60s. Great, you know, Beatles, um, Beach Boys, great music of the 60s get to play during these, this, this show. And the other thing is Greengrass. Anyone know the story? They know Greengrass is a scum, but he's a like, yeah, I like him. He's a likeable scum, and he's always up to stuff. Well, this time he was, uh, he found a coin, an ancient coin in the grounds of the Lord who he was trying to do a bit of work for. And they were going away for the weekend. The Lord and the lady were going away and he offered to do more. And he got in a backhoe to dig up the lawn to find the treasure because he was told where there's one coin, there's usually a pile of coins hidden in a clay jar. Long story short, they eventually found it after going through a water pipe water everywhere and found it just in time for the Lord to come home and claim the riches for himself. But they used to bury their treasures in clay jars as well. You know, you go down to the creek, you see that big tree, you walk 20 paces uh, north and then two paces west and dig and there's the treasure. Well, that's where you bury it. So clay jars were very well known, very common, everyday use, use for lots of different things but incredibly fragile. And that's really the point here. Paul is saying, but we are jars of clay. We are fragile. We know it's difficult to keep turning up, to keep showing up. But he says, verse seven, but we have this treasure and they would have understood that too because they use it for treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We see there, uh, verse one reminds us again, uh, therefore since through God's mercy we have this ministry. What's the treasure? And it was like, what's his ministry? And, and the chapter before, chapter three uh, uh, and two, talks about his ministry, the ministry of the new covenant, the ministry in which he was involved. What's the treasure? The treasure is the gospel. Like we have the gospel to share. We have the, the good news of Jesus Christ to share. Chapter 5, verse 17 and onwards I read, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Why do we keep showing up? It can be hard, it can be tiring, it can be confrontational. It can be really difficult. We can feel really inadequate. We have the message of the greatest story of history. Like the, the, the message of Jesus Christ, where he came, he suffered, he died, he rose again, he's coming back. 
He came to save us from our sin, to offer us eternal life. He came to adopt us into his family. There is no other great message that comes anywhere near the message of the gospel. All other messages can be, can be good and great, but they're temporary. And they don't go to the issue of our sin, and they don't go to the issue of eternity. Only the treasure that we have in our flimsy jar of clay. And if we don't share the message, if we don't tell people about Jesus, if they don't, uh, don't recognise their sinfulness and, and become reconciled to God, as he says there, as they don't come a new creation, their life in this world is not great and their life in eternity is absolutely horrible. Because it is without God, it is in eternity of hell. We have the gospel in this jar of clay. And it's too important not to share. Have the parable that Jesus told of this guy who found a treasure in a field, buried in the field, presumably one of these jars with treasure inside. Uh, like, oh, wow. What did he do? This treasure was so valuable. He sold everything he had so he could buy the field and gain the treasure. Such is the value of the treasure. It's beyond anything that we could otherwise possess. Absolutely anything and everything. But unlike that parable, which is just telling us the value of the kingdom, because we now have this treasure, it's too important not to share. And so when Jesus gave us uh, the Great Commission, it's a Great Commission, as we've said, for every Christian. Like we are to go and make disciples. Or as uh, we put it around here a bit more frequently, is like we, are, we have the mission of the church is more people, more like Jesus. We are to share the treasure that we have in our jars of clay so that people might hear the gospel, come to Jesus and grow into his likeness, become disciples of him and therefore reproduce in terms of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like the treasure is, is the power to save, but also the power to sustain. And so Paul says, we, 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 our vessel is weak, our vessel is fragile. But in it, we have this treasure to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. He goes on to say, Look, we can be hard-pressed on every side, but because the message is too important not to share, we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but because the message is too important not to share, we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but in, because the message is too important not to share, we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but because the message is too important not to share, we are not destroyed. We carry it in this body of flesh. To share with others. That they might hear and respond to the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, we keep showing up because the message is too important not to share. Um, and it can, be, it can be tough, it can be difficult, but it's temporary where the gospel is eternal. The message we have is eternal. 
But Jesus lived the life we couldn't live. He lived a sinless life. And he died the death that we deserve to die. He rose again, which proved all that he said and all that he did. And he's coming again because he always keeps his promises. Like it is an important message. It is the most important message there is in the whole world. And we are, if you are in Christ, we are honored and privileged to have that message in this jar of clay. And it's not just from us. Like our fragile body is, you know. It's from God. It's from God. And so we, we keep turning up. And it makes a difference in the lives of people and it makes a difference in the, in the world. Like it makes a difference in the lives of people, when, when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, they are taken from the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And it's like, that's just not some philosophical, airy-fairy thing. It is absolute truth. And it is absolute reality. No longer are they heading for a, uh, an eternity in hell but they have already entered into eternal life with God right now and will share with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So where's your jar? Does it like contain like the Dead Sea Scrolls? Do we, do we get this really inside us and learn it really well, which is good? But does it get hidden away in some cave? Where's your jar? Is it got the treasure, but have you buried the treasure? Just so nobody else can see it? Or is it full of living water? Or is it like the oil and the wick is a light to the world? Where's your jar? We're fragile and we break. But God uses our fragility. God uses our brokenness so that the message that we give is obviously from God and not ourselves. God uses our brokenness for his glory. When we are weak, then he is strong. His glory shines all around. And so we, uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Where's your jar? You can, you can grow and grow and grow into the likeness of Christ. You can know and build relationships, genuine relationships with other people. You can perhaps sow a few seeds of, uh, of the gospel in other people's lives. You can, you know, work together with uh, uh, the body of Christ. But we need to persevere. We need to keep showing up. Where's your jar? Remember the message that we have, the treasure that we have is a treasure that is too important not to share. If today um, you recognize that, oh, I don't, I don't have this treasure. I didn't really know or understand that Jesus came and, and died on the cross for me to pay the penalty which I should pay for 
my sin of rejecting him, then encourage you today to talk to the one you came with, talk to the one near you, talk to uh, uh, someone nearby or someone you know, someone you trust, and chat to them about it. But more importantly, respond to the Spirit's prompting in you. You see, part of the role of the Spirit of God is to convict and convince you that you need Jesus. And if you're sensing that now, that's because he's at work in your heart now. But maybe f for some, it's like the, the jar is, is located somewhere like deep underground or it's hidden away, whatever. It's not out there with sharing the living water. It's not out there uh, being the light to the world. Maybe too, the Holy Spirit is convicting and convincing you of your need to be involved in God's plan A, the Great Commission for every Christian, where we, we need to ensure that these principles become part of who we are, become part of our life and our lifestyle, become part of, uh, of reaching others for Jesus become part of building his kingdom so that his kingdom would continue to grow. Not his church, but his kingdom would continue to grow where people would be taken from darkness into light. People would be taken from death into life. People would become, as he calls it, a new creation because we are the ambassadors. We are the ones with you know, jars of clay, but we are the ones with the treasure of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's too good, too important not to share. Let's pray. Father, we sing that old hymn, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Sounds gory but we know the reality of, of the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I just commend everyone here to you now. Lord, if some don't know you yet as Saviour and Lord, then I pray that today would be the day of salvation, as your word mentions right there, just after that passage, that today would be the day of their salvation. Well, Lord, for those who, uh, you know, the, the, the treasure's hidden because the jar's not located in the right place. Lord, you would change our hearts and that we might recognise the importance of showing and telling Jesus. And I simply ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.